every event we have, uh, Kathy Higuchi makes a cheese ball. So it's kind of a part of our, our program, and she made one appropriate or a murder mystery. That's the outline for the yes, of victim. Course. So as they finish it, the outline will be left. <laughs> What's coming out of the wound here? Blood, of course. Yeah, wood. <laughs> Our focus is organizing events for what we call young seniors. And before anybody gets uh, insulted by this, you know that if you're a Japanese American, you have to be 95 to be a real senior. So. <laughs> but today, we're really lucky to have acclaimed author Naomi Hirahara to talk about her writing. Uh, Naomi is best known for her two mystery series, The Masarai Mystery, mystery featuring the American-born Hibakusha uh, and Los Angeles-based Gardner and the series featuring Ellie Rush, LAPD detective. Um, the uh, names of some of her books, I'm sure you're very familiar. Summer of the Big Bachi, Gasa Gasa Girl, and the Edgar Award winning Sh Snake Skin Shamisen. Um, also uh, in the Ellie Rush series, A Murder on Bamboo Lane, and, which is the winner of the T. Jefferson Parker Mystery Award, and Grave on Grand Avenue. Um, Naomi is also the author of many nonfiction works, some biographies and his, histories of significant parts of Japanese American history. Um, Naomi's knowledge of Japanese American history and personalities and culture, and also uh, many issues in our community, and her very strong sense of place make her novels so satisfying. I think a lot of people have mentioned that uh, they recognize a lot of the characters in her book and in their own family. <laughs> and um, I know what she means when she mentions places like the Far East Cafe. And I just have to tell you that I just love her description of Hamyu as looking like greasy day-old cream of wheat. <laughs> I feel like she's, she has some of my memory. <laughs> um, so anyway, I want to welcome Naomi. Welcome, Naomi. Susan, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, this is actually the first time for me to be at Yoaikai, so I hope to have a mini tour afterwards. Um, and it's so great. Um, I've done uh, writing programs with seniors in um, Japanese American seniors in the Los Angeles area, so this is a community that's very important to me. So I'm going to be doing a very brief um, PowerPoint because I've told that we're such a visual community that people like to see pictures. Yes. <laughs> so I'll be showing some pictures. But, it'll be, and, but I want to engage with you and have, you know, if you have any questions for me, if you all are writing at all, and um, if, if I could answer them or comment, I would love to. Um, so, let's see, let me see if this clicker, okay, so um, when, when I was asked what to call this talk, I was thinking of roots. Uh, my father was born in Watsonville, California, and I, I had attended Stanford. So, you know, I have some connection to this general area. So, um, I think for me, um, I, I came up, there's an a independent bookstore called Book Passage that's in Corte Madera. So that was my main purpose for coming here. Um, and yesterday, um, I was with writers that have such great imagination, like they tra they're they like a British Hakujin guy who could write about a Lo Laotian um, coroner, you know, during the 1970s. But I actually write about things I'm very close to, and, um, and one theme that really comes up is family. So these are a couple pictures from, you know, our family album, um, That's Me with the Fish, and I'm sure many of you have had experiences fishing, even either in the ocean or the rivers or lakes, and in the back is my father, you know, and his gators, right? And we use sand crabs. Did you ever use sand crabs? He had this weird contraption that hole, had holes all over it, and we, we would drag it along the shore, and the sand crabs would get trapped in it, and we would use it for bait. We would put it up and use it for bait. Of course, I'm sure we contributed to the overfishing, and also on Pismo Beach, we overclammed, and now you can't get any clams. But that was a lot of my, like, that was vacation. That was vacation for us. Um, the other photo is um, myself and my extended family. My mother's there. 
um, the person holding the baby, this is my brother's um, one year birthday party, um, was my grandmother. And my grandmother was um, from, um, she never came to uh, permanently live in um, here in America, but when my brother was born, she came from Hiroshima and stayed with us for a year. So my, um, so the whole story of Hiroshima is, and I'm sure many of you have roots in Hiroshima, but on both sides of my family, you know, is the story of Hiroshima in different ways. The other people in this photo were other, um, our we had, we, we don't have a lot of relatives here. We have extended relatives like here in the Watsonville area. But in terms of Southern California, in terms of my, my mother had no really blood, not many blood relatives. And my father only had um, one brother. And this, these are his kids. So I had one set of cousins. And um, there are some family friends in this photo. And we, the patriarchs were all gardeners. So I lived a very typical Japanese American life, especially for a Kibe Nisei family. Um, I was part of the whole gardening network. And um, I am so happy that I have that as part of my background. A lot of my writing colleagues, their, you know, their parent was a writer, and that wasn't really, this is a new thing for my whole family. Another thing besides family is um, I do have a love for history, and I worked for, as at the Rafu Shimpo newspaper as um, a reporter and editor. And um, I subsequently was, after I left the paper, I was asked to like do these community projects. And I know Lewis was, I did a, a book called Green Makers, Japanese Americans of Southern California. And Lewis Kawahara, my good friend up over there, he, he did um, a book about the Northern Cal gardeners. It was out, outside work? Outside, outside work. So, um, and up to this point, I think this was in the late 1990s, early 2000s, no one really wrote about the gardeners, you know? They would say, yeah, the rich farmers, they, they, you know, those Japanese books, they get a big layout, but not, you know, but a lot of the gardeners help fund, you know, churches and community centers, and so this was their uh, um, time to shine. Um, so they asked me, so I worked on this project with them. And one thing is the photos, you know, I went, we actually have a Southern California Gardeners Federation office. And they had these photo albums and they were filled with gardeners in suits at all these events. And I'm going, wait a minute, we need some of you gardening. And they, like, it was something that they, on one hand, they were proud that they were hardworking, but on the other side, I think they were hasukashi or a little embarrassed about being gardeners, so they didn't really have people, uh, photos of them at work, right? But they did love their cars, they did love their trucks, so we were able to slowly dig some photos out, and um, so this one is about, uh, with a um, Kibe Nisei, Beverly Hills uh, gardener, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think he might have spent some time in um, the Pacific Northwest as well. Um, but he, um, it, it's, it's really interesting because the Southern California gardeners became more organized, I think in the 19, late 1920s, early 30s, during the depression, because Hakujin people were starting, or non-Japanese were starting to get into the profession. And so they were trying to keep Japanese gardeners outside of um, Beverly Hills. They're trying, and, and and that's where the Japanese American gardeners organized. And, 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 and they saw the power of being a group together. Um, and this is a story of um, gardeners, you know, after the war, after World War II. Even if you had a degree, you know, you're released from camp, what are you gonna do, you know? So in Southern California, one out of 10 um, Japanese American men were gardeners. And some of them just did it for a short period of time and then did something else. This gentleman, Mac Yamaguchi, uh, moved to Pasadena. He got this beat up boat. There's a hostel in um, Boyle Heights and he, in the east part of LA, and he got a, he, he was able to get a, this beat up pickup truck and a, a, a push mower. And I don't know why, but he put the push mower in front of his car. <laughs> I have no idea. 
and he was like racing on, you know, he and another young gardener were racing down the streets of Pasadena early in the morning because they were young, they needed some excitement. Um, but, it, you know, I think it was a transitional job and it really sustained the community. Um, in terms of Max's case, um, there was a local um, Chevy dealer and he noticed, hey, there's a lot of these Japanese people buying trucks, you know, I need to get a Japanese sell car salesman. So he hired a Mac and then Mac noticed, oh, these gardeners, they need insurance. So he eventually got in, he became an insurance salesman. So it's, you know, there were former gardeners who opened up gas stations and then all these gardeners came and filled up gas there. So it was a, a very important work. Um, another thing I had written about is flowers, and this is also a post-war. They called this particular kind of gar um, gardenia the mystery gardenia, and now that will feature um, later in the presentation. So, um, Mas Arai. Who is Mas Arai? He's uh, definitely inspired by my father, but Mas is not my father. Um, if you've read any of the books, you know Moss is a bit of a curmudgeon. <laughs> and my dad had his rough patches, but he was very, we had, we were very, very tight. Um, and he was, like I said, he was born in Watsonville, but was taken over to Japan with his other older siblings. Um, and they lived in, on the outskirts of Hiroshima. And um, so, and he was a hibaksha. So he was actually at the train station, kind of like, just like Masarai, um, when the bomb fell. And um, so, and so this particular photo was, is from his uh, photo album. Um, and as some of you may know, a lot of like the younger um, Japanese in Japan, especially in a place like Hiroshima, they had to do work. They, they suspended school and they had to do different kinds of uh, work. And my father had to work in the train station. And um, this photo is so cute to me because he writes Isamu Hirahara, which was his name. His nickname was Sam. So take the word Sam and you know rearrange the letters and you get Mas. That was totally <laughs> subconscious. It was not. It was not intentional, but that's how your mind works. You know, weird things start to happen. You know, Moss is a very common, you know, nickname in our community. And, um, but underneath Isamu Hirahara, he writes me. <laughs> and, you know, and that's the type of person he was. He was very quirky. So, um, he, so he does, he only had American citizenship, just like Moss. So he was easily able to come, uh, return to his birthplace, America, in um, like 1947, 1940, very relatively soon. And then he went to live with his relatives in Watsonville. It, they call it the Redmond Hirahara House, and it's along the highway, you know, Aggie knows where, you know, it's, it looks kind of scary, like a haunted house, but, you know, but my, it was a magnificent house in its prime. So after doing like 10, uh, strawberry farming, those things, my father decided to move south to Los Angeles. And what do you do? You become a gardener. So that's what he did. And this is one of the rare, I think the only photo I have of my dad gardening, and I think it was taken by his customer. You know, it's like, I have a Japanese gardener. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> and, he, you know, and the gardeners either wore a, uh, a baseball cap. My character wears a baseball cap, but my dad apparently wore a pith helmet um, at this particular time. It was the 60s. And, um, and this uh, particular lawnmower, I believe, was actually made in Southern California. And they made it lower because there are so many Japanese in the gardening profession. So in terms of, so I wanted to write a story. Um, you know, I tell people I like to write about invisible people people that are unseen, you know, and I felt like my father and my family is part of that community because how many times do, even today, we ourselves, you know, we don't really see the gardener, right? Let's be honest, we don't really see the gardener working there in our neighborhood. And um, I just felt like that's the way my father was perceived. You know, that he was, and I wanted, and, and him being a hibaksha, I thought that was like a story worth telling, 
to a larger audience. And I, I felt, um, I, when it comes to my own family story, I feel safer writing fiction than nonfiction. So, you know, I want to observe their privacy. It's kind of strange because I'm a reporter, a former reporter. We're always nosing around, asking questions of people. But I think with my family, since it's so personal, I, you know, they, I want them to have their own lives. But I do take inspiration from them to write fiction. And so I thought my father's story, him being an American-born, Hibaksha might be more palatable to the American public, or it's a new way to talk about the Hiroshima story. Because you're talking about an American who was in Hiroshima, you know, because I didn't want to get into this whole political, you know, argument like we should have dropped, yeah, I'm glad we dropped it, you know, we saved lives, or no, we should, you know, it just, that was not my whole intention. My main intention was to tell our family story or to tell a story that I felt people hadn't heard of. And then you, with this more information, people could make their own decisions. Um, and also, um, it was an homage to the Japanese gardener too, because you know, in general, how much they had helped our community. So the first book, Summer of the Big Bachi, um, it took, I wrote 15 bloody years, <laughs> at least, Three bloody rewrites, more than 20 versions of the first chapter, and yeah, some somebody yesterday said they rewrote their first chapter like 70 times. Um, four different titles. Um, I think the first uh, L.A. Shakes was the first one, and you know, but um, when it became Summer of the Big Bachi, even my husband was going, I think this is it. There's something that captures this book correctly. And a lot of rejections from agents and small press publishers. And then finally, it was published. <laughs> <laughs> so this was actually, um, my parents, um, they were elated, but this was with their worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and to prepare them before the release, I took them, there was a mystery conference in Monterey, so I took, it moves around, so it happened to be Monterey. It was a it was good location for them because they could visit the relatives in Watsonville. Um, but I had these cards made that said meet Maserai, you know, Japanese American gardener, you know, atomic bomb survivor, um, amateur sleuth, a reluctant detective. And my I showed it to my dad. My dad, mind you, was helping me this whole time. He looked at it, goes, Hey, this is me. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mom sinks on the hotel bed and goes, oh, what are we going to do? You know, it's like, all oh, my friends are going to think this is about us, you know. And I go, you know what, and that was one reason why I took them to this conference, because this conference is really all white, you know, it's like, I'm trying to bring this story to this audience, you know. And I just told them, you guys have to be strong. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's why I mentioned there's no like writers in my you know my my parents family so it's an adjustment because this is a really weird profession you know and um, it's very odd <laughs> especially if you write something so about like a certain community it's one thing if you're by writing zombies or you know whatever they're not gonna say well did that really happen to you you know but this kind of thing is different right um, I, yeah, I think part of my subtitle today was telling lies to tell the truth, and so I do mine the things that I wrote, uh, I've written in nonfiction, into my mysteries. Um, so, and and one thing that's fun is, like, if there's a book on you know Japanese American history, you know, like only certain people will get that book. But if it's a mystery, people are like, oh, a dead body, you know, you know, and then oh, I'm happy. I, I'm, re I'm learning about all this other stuff. So this was my second book, Gasa Gasa Girl, and this took place in New York. And it's uh, the dead body is found in this, this um, empty koi pond in uh, Prospect Park in, um, New in Brooklyn. And there's a clue and this beautiful gardenia. So Moss, being the gardener, he knows this is no ordinary gardenia that 
you know. Um, and gardenias cannot be um, imported into America because they need, they're a very delicate flower, they need um, to be in soil, and there's like nematode, there's a lot of stuff that people don't want to bring over from another country here, so. So, and this was from that flower market book that I mentioned earlier. Um, with the third book, um, I married into a Uchinanchu family. <laughs> my, um, my husband, both sides are, um, have roots into Okinawa. So when Mama, the grandma, died, um, I was not married to him yet, but I was still like dating. And we were cleaning out the house and there was a broken down shamisen, but it was covered in this snake skin. And I, you know, it's like, myself loving history, like, I kind of wanted it, you know? I'm the opposite of Mary Kondo. Oh. <laughs> Mary Kondo. <laughs> oh, I want that. But it's like, I had no claims. But I go, that would be, you know, why is it covered in snakeskin? And, you know, then I started to learn more about um, the Okinawan and Okinawan American experience. So um, this uh, was my third book. And um, um, in place, I don't know if you know the South Bay in, Southern California, Gardena, Torrance, there's a lot of Japanese Americans, and Okin the Okinawan Association is in Gardena. And um, that is my, uh, my uh, husband's grandparents in the photo with the shamisen. Okay, so that book, it was really exciting. It won an Edgar Allan Poe Award. Yeah, so that's Stephen King. Yeah, that was, I think, in uh, 2008 or something. And I'm with, that Stephen King was the Grand Master at the time he was on the left. His, what was it? His daughter, his daughter is named Naomi or something like that. It's very cute. You, you know that? Yeah, so uh, some Stephen King fans here. He was very nice. And the woman to the right is Lisa Sc Scottolini. She's a best selling. She was part, so the way the Edgars work is your own peers are part of the judging panel and they read all these books and this was in the category of best paperback original so um and that's the award my mom my mom came to me with uh, to new york i brought her but she didn't want to go to the well she asked me uh, i go do you want to go to the award ceremony because i have to get her a ticket she goes are you going to win <laughs> <laughs> and i was going i i honest i wasn't you know uh, being humble, I, I really didn't think, I was like competing with these four other men and they're very tall, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, I don't think I'm gonna win. And she goes, okay, so I, I'll just stay in the hotel room. <laughs> and, and it would be, it was fine. My agent came with me and I think I'd be more nervous if my mother was there. Cause if I didn't win, she'd go, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> you know, and I feel so terrible. So it's like, it's a, so we, so, I got the award and Sonia, my agent at the time, went to the room. My mom's wearing a cap over her head and her pajamas, I'm like this is, you know, so she was delighted. But she goes, when are you getting the real award? And I was like, this is the award. I know it looks like a toy. Goes, it looks like a mocha. <laughs> but that's Edgar Allan Poe. So Moss kept multiplying. I honestly, you know, since the first book took me 15 years, I, I didn't know how many books I would be able to write. I had no idea that he, these stories would keep multiplying. So the, uh, let's see, the, so the fourth one is Blood Hina, Strawberry Yellow, I believe we have some, that's the story that takes place in Watsonville, California. And that house, I, I call it the STEM house, but it's actually modeled after the Redmond Hirahara house. And um, Sayonara Slam, um, it takes place at Dodger Stadium and kind of involves um, Japanese baseball players here, um, as well as Japanese-Korean relations, which is kind of, yeah, a loaded topic. And that's one thing I love, just being a Japanese-American writer, that I can write about some of these very kind of sensitive issues. But because I'm not from Japan, <laughs> You know, I feel like I have more freedom, and maybe Americans are unaware of some of these issues. From there, I did a couple of these Ellie Rush books, um, and she's a hapa um, in her 20s, and she goes around downtown LA in her bicycle. 
and Moss actually makes a cameo in Grave on Grand Avenue. So that's one thing, you know, I have this fictional world and um, I try to connect, like I have a, a middle grade book too, and just like these characters will pop up, you know, in these other books. So if you're, a and I have one reader in uh, Southern California who's, who mentioned that, oh, I saw Haru in A Thousand One Cranes, and I go, yep, you know, so she, she gets an award for that. <laughs> so, um, so last year, um, I published my final Moss um, Orion mystery, and I knew after the third book was published, I knew that I had to figure out when I was going to end this. Some authors just keep writing more and more mysteries, but um, to tell you quite honestly, the mystery world is very tumultuous. You don't know who's going to drop you or, you know, um, authors, you could always self-publish a book, but it's not going to be at a bookstore, you know, so it's like, okay, I want to figure out how do I want to end it. And I knew, I liked the number seven, and I knew with seven, I wanted Moss um, to return to Hiroshima. And so he's 69 in the first book. By the last book, he's 86. And um, yeah, so, and I even got a grant. And it's, for those of you who know of someone who wants to do a project that requires travel to Japan, there's something called the Aurora Foundation. And I applied for the grant. You only have to be, uh, you have to be an American who resides in California and have a very special project. And my special project was to actually go to Hiroshima to do research for this book. Of course, I have relatives in Hiroshima, but it's different when you stay with relatives. You know, they, they want to take you to places. And I had to really, and I wanted to kind of stay in downtown Hiroshima too. Um, and also, um, I did research. There's a small island off of Hiroshima called Ninoshima. And after the bomb fell, a lot of people, you know, of course, Hiroshima was decimated. A lot of people took rafts. They, they, they all went, thousands of people went to this island of Ninoshima to try to find shelter and to you know, recuperate. So it's a, it, it has a very interesting background. They have an orphanage there for um, people because for, um, and they also have a retirement home, which actually my relatives on my mother's side help manage. So in terms of the retirement home, like in the olden days, right in Japan, there was more filet of piety. They're more looking after the elders. And um, so if you lost your children, what would happen? So that's why they started the retirement home there. Um, and then for the, yeah, so there was also a foster care place as well. And both of those places still exist today. Um, so I want to read to you a, a, a few paragraphs from Hiroshima Boy. So he had left Hiroshima in um, about 19, uh, in the 1940s, as I mentioned. He didn't go back until maybe 1990s, so a long time. And there was different reasons for that. And in Moss's case too, he had not gone back, he had gone back briefly. Oh, my dad did go back to marry my mother because she's Shinise and, and Moss had gone to, done the same thing, but he hadn't gone back since that time. This, in this scene, he's going to um, visit his, uh, um, his, his uh, family's, family's home and his niece that he's never met is living there. Let's see. I don't know how much I should read here. You know what? I'll read a little more ago. Okay. Moss remembered traveling on the same train line, not the same train car, of course, when he was about nine. His older brothers got fitted for custom-made suits for a family portrait, but time had gotten away from his mother, and they had to leave before Moss was measured. Again, he was passed over, and he couldn't stand it. He made a fuss from the tailors to the Hiroshima train station and then on the rail car. His older brothers were sick of it, and they weren't the only ones. Go over there and sit down, his mother clothed in a kimono commanded. He was mad as hell and he refused to sit among strangers in the back. The anger shot up to his head, and there was no containing it. He rushed to the open side door and jumped. 
He didn't know how he survived the fall, and neither did anyone else who witnessed it. He had rolled close to the bottom of the track, but only sustained a bruised knee. You're Baka, his brothers had said to him, but they were incredulous over his luck. From then on, they said, Ungai, that Moss, the middle child, was blessed with good fortune. He thought that it was a terrible joke, one more way that they twisted the knife in his back. The rail car going towards Kure was vacant. The Hiroshima train station itself had been crowded with both Japanese and Gaijin t in town for the atomic bomb commemoration. By the time Moss reached the port of Ujina on the ferry, the mourning ceremony was over. The whole town seemed festive with an air of electricity. All fools, thought Moss, as am I. Who would think about going home after all these years? It was ridiculous, meaningless. Real home was Altadena, California, the place where he became a father, had two wives, not at the same time, of course, and helped raise a grandchild. California was open and free with purple mountains and salty brown water beaches and dying palm trees and lavender, lavender jacaranda trees. Liberated green parrots found refuge in California, squawking as loud as they could on power lines in the early morning hours. Coyotes roamed the streets at night during the occasional downpour. Brown bears bathed in swimming pools and mountain lions stocked hiking trails. It was a magical place where anything was possible. That was home. But as the train car bounced and click clack over rail ties, Moss real, realized that what was outside these windows was also home. The graceful arches of the Japanese roofs and the color of foliage on the hills, not Midori, American green, but Ao, the word used for blue, but also a blue green. The name of the color of the sky could not be separated from the color of the trees here in Japan. There was also the sense of shibui, the love for negative space, to keep the canvas of life a bit empty to allow something unexpected to permeate it. And the turns of the Japanese garden, how to open up the world by taking a stroll in a different direction. As much as his head and heart tried to reject Japan, his body felt that this was home too. So that's a scene. So that was last year. I had um, also um, finished a book with my friend Heather Lindquist on, it's called Life After Mansonar, which some of you might be familiar with. So that was last year. That was kind of a heavy year. And there's so much you know, dissension and anger in this country. And I go, I need to go to a happy place. I need to take a break, you know, and, and that, um, is one reason why I started working on this book set in Kauai mm -hmm. called Iced in Paradise. Let's see, and this book is, you guys are getting an early preview because it's not officially out to September 3rd. Um, so Hawaii is my happy place. Um, anyone else, Hawaii? Yeah. I know some of you are actually from Hawaii. You may have more of a mixed, Experience, but this was like um, after this is our honeymoon, my husband and I, um, and so it, it was also in response um, to a lot of um, the New York publishers. They have this subgenre called cozy mysteries, and it's where people have they. It's a comforting kind of mystery, like the British tea cozy mystery. But in, if Americans write about places with lighthouses, you know, just really idyllic places. But some of, some of these places, I would love to go, and I would go, but people are, who li inhabit those villages might not look at me as part of their community. Mm -hmm. So I think Hawaii is one of these places where my husband and I could visit, and they go, hey, the, the driver, you know, of the shuttle, you know, hey, you around here? <laughs> You're from around here? And I was like, no, we're from California. <laughs> but just the fact that you're mistaken for someone who could be from there is like, like okay, maybe part of me could belong here. Um, so my uh, main character, it's kind of, uh, this, this mystery is related to the Ellie Rush mysteries. Um, and there's a, some commonalities, um, the lead, character here is a young woman too and her name is Leilani Santiago she's part Japanese Filipina and white 
and she's mixed and it's as in Hawaii, right? That's part of, um, it's not unusual. Um, and they have a shave ice place near Waimea Canyon, you know, and um, I wanted to write more about the south side of Kauai, you know, they don't get as much love, it's drier there, and I just love that canyon too. So, um, so Leilani had gone to school, she never was able to graduate, she went to school in S Seattle, and then her mother um, had been diagnosed with MS, and she, and she has three younger sisters, and so she felt like she had to go home to help with the shave ice place. And shave ice is something I lo I've loved since going to Japan, kakigori, you know, like my summers when you have the uji kintoki, you know, with the little mochis, you know, and I, and I just, um, just love the whole evolution of shave ice. So it was something I, an another happy place thing. Um, but this is a mystery, and as I got into the mystery, you know, certain things came up, like in this book is t discussion of how Hawaiian land rights, and there's alcoholism issues, and since I'm a mystery writer, I guess these things can help to, and of course there's a dead body too. <laughs> um, and this is a surfer, a golden boy from Orange County is the victim, a surfer, and um, Leilani's father, who was training him as a professional surfer, is accused. So, um, as a result, there's some money problems. So, um, who f one of the side characters is Bachan. So, I'm not going to explain what a Bachan is because I'm assuming all of you know. <laughs> and if you don't know, ask your neighbor afterwards. <laughs> so, Bachan has to help. Um, she's mortgaged the house, you know, to to assist her son in his legal troubles. So. During our six block drive home, Bachan holds her purse shut as if someone is going to be grabbing its contents. Your Jichang went work so hard for that house, all his military pay and everything. You didn't have to do it, I want to say to her, but that would be a lie. There's no other alternative for the Santiago's. Your papa sold that surfboard for your mama's medicine. He won't say it, but I know. I'm shocked to hear that, but it makes sense. I've been making COBRA payments on my own medical insurance, not really thinking about my parents' situation or my little sisters. When Bachan gets home, she starts rummaging in the kitchen, rearranging our mixing bowls, cleaning our cracked tile counters. We hear some crowing in the backyard a few feet away. What that? Sophie comes into the kitchen, this is one of the younger sisters. That's Jimmy Bachan, she explains. What that Jimmy? It's her rooster from the North Shore. I sit at the kitchen table with my bare feet on one of the chairs. My sore ankle is starting to smart and I placed a bag of frozen edamame on it. I know like one booga rooster in my house. He's not inside the house, he's outside. I don't care one mile away, he's out. Bachan picks up the largest knife that we have in the house, a huge Chinese cleaver that Mama Lu loaned us when we, we loaned us that we never returned and heads out the back door. No, Bachan! Sophie shrieks, chasing her. I cover my eyes. This is one mess I will not even try to clean up. No rooster is slaughtered that night, although not for Bachan's lack of trying. Turns out Jimin is actually smarter than he looks and expertly dodges Bachan's cleaver hacks. We do have a bird for dinner that night, but it's one from the poultry section of Big Save Market. Mom makes her signature chicken long rice, a gingerly soup with clear cellophane noodles. All five of us are quiet around the table, elbow to elbow as we slurp and swallow. After dinner, the girls go off to watch a samurai movie with Bachan in her room and I help mom wash the dishes and put them away. I wipe a chawan bowl with a dish towel court had embroidered with an orange koi. What did you see in him? I asked mom. Her hand scrubbing another bowl in the dishwater, she turns to me a bit lost. Dad. He was hot for one thing. She rinses the chawan and gives it to me. Yuck, mom. Mom was in college when she spent a summer on Kauai and fell in love. That resulted in a surprise, me, that fast-tracked their relationship and led mom to drop out of Cal State Long Beach and move here, much to her parents' objections. 
You remember watching your dad surf? I do. He looked like a superhero, Aquaman, with his wet long hair plastered down his back, his muscular legs controlling that board. That caught my eye, but it was his pure heart that got me. Huh? That was unexpected. You seen one other man with a pure heart? Mom had spent more of her life in Kauai than in California, and sometimes a pigeon can't help but come up out at times like this. Well, D-Man for one, I think, but when I think about it more, D-Man, this is someone who owns a bar in their area, is dependable but not passionate. Sometimes I have no idea what he's thinking. Sometimes I think that dad, I think dad hates me, even after everything I do to help. Leilani, no, he loves you. She shakes the excess soap from another chawan. Just you two the same. You both rather give stink eye than a smile. <laughs> it's true that I'm not one of those naturally happy people like Court. Do you know that he watched every one of your volleyball games? Nuh-uh. Kelly took videos and sent them over to me to show your dad. No, he never say. Dad didn't want you to know. Make a fuss. For reals? That was hard to believe. He's probably more Japanese than Pinoy. Got that strict bachan spirit in him. You just like him, can't sh so can't show off. What mom is saying somehow makes sense, that it's not only about me, but the family. The family is part of me. Mom stops washing and looks me straight in the eye. Her dripping hands raise as if she's preparing to do some surgery. I don't want you to sacrifice your life for us, for me. After all of this is over, it will be over, Leilani. I want you to go back to Seattle, be with your boyfriend and follow your dreams. I stay quiet and put my weight on my good leg. I have no idea what my dreams could be. Mm. Well, you know, some people say, well, where's the mystery in that? And um, I do, you know, it, a lot of it is just about um, a simple life, you know, and just a family kind of trying to work things together. Things aren't perfect. And, and it's also talking about community, so those are kind of, and um, I didn't want it to be a typical mystery, so, um, you know, it's not Leilani's like being like Nancy Drew, per se, <laughs> but, um, but I had to write three scenes in jails in Hawaii, so, yeah, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm coming to the end. I just want to tell you, so Moss has turned French. There's like three books. Um, the, the first three were translated in France. Um, they didn't really do gangbusters <laughs> in France. I think the translator was trying to somehow capture his cadence and Moss speaks in dialect in French. But somehow I don't think it worked out, but it's okay. There's some books in France, some people like them, and then um, two of them so far have been translated in Japanese. And they're out of print though, so. Um, but if you know someone who's in, on Audible, they're also both in English and Japanese audiobooks. So, um, Gasa Gasa Garu, for those who can read uh, Katakana and Snake skin shamisen. Yeah. And what's interesting about the covers is, do you notice how small Moss is? <laughs> it's like his female, the first one is supposed to be his daughter with a gun, and um, the second one is um, a Japanese Peruvian American waitress. That, yeah. So, but I love it that um, Moss is eating spam musubi. <laughs> and then my my relatives saw my mother that lived here, they go, I, they were like looking at the manga covers. They go, I don't think they understood your book. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? I'm working on a historical right now set in Chicago. And um, it's in 1944, so it's, a, it's kind of based on some of the research I did for the Manson Art book, because Chicago was a huge area where Japanese, and many of you, I'm sure, have ties to Chicago in, in one way or the other. Went from 400 Japanese Americans to 20,000 in a very short period of time. And there was a lot of crimes that happened there. So for me as a mystery writer, it's very rich. And I was talking to my friends, Akiko and Luz, you know, I'm trying to capture the Nisei voice 
female voice, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm hoping to do it in this book, so we'll see if I can pull it off. Um, and this is what I say to people, something very exciting may or may not happen with Hi Hiroshima Boy in Japan. Uh -huh. But there's some, talk, some interesting things that may happen. So stay tuned if you want. Um, I have a newsletter, so you could go to my website and, and sign up. And I'm going to, you know, when I can announce, and I may not announce because nothing happened, I'll, I'll tell you all there. But, but that's about it. I'll take your questions. Any questions from anybody? Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know what? What's really tough? It's like I've written like ten mysteries now, so it's like, oh, I already had a person die from this. <laughs> I gotta change it up and do with this one. Um, with the Masa Rise, what I was, I was going, okay, I'm in my own way. No one would notice, but I was trying to. With each mystery, I was trying to write a different kind of mystery, although they're all basically very similar. Um, the first one, a lot of people have said it's kind of like a crossover mystery and literary fiction. It's the plot, the mystery plot is not super strong in that book, but I was trying to um, explore other things. The second book, it was like more like a, um, you know, upstairs, downstairs, kind of like the maid and, you know, like what you see in a lot of, um, I, I guess I, I'm, um, influenced by a lot of British detective fiction. And it was more domestic. So how long did my first book take me? Remember? <laughs> 15 years. And then when I finally got a contract, um, Random House wanted a second book the following year. And I was already commissioned to do this book on the flower market. So I had like a very short period of time. And how do you follow the atomic bombing? You know, so I'm going. I'm going to make this a domestic story, and then um, his daughter Mari hasn't appeared yet, so I'll take it over to New York. So I, I wanted it to be a smaller type of mystery. Um, a lot of times, it's the clue um, with the Masa Rise that mysteries that really help me. So once I figure the clue, it it kind of starts. It's either a red herring, which is leads you in the wrong direction, or it's really part of the right thing. So, um, and then the third one, snakes get, I can't remember what kind of mystery that was supposed to be. Um, I, I guess a little bit, oh, and Blood Hina was more like a drug mystery, you know, a drug and international espionage kind of thing. And then I think, um, what was, so in my own weird way, oh, the Strawberry Yellow was kind of like a biotech thriller. <laughs> so I was attempting to do different things with different styles with each book, um, which required, like in um, <coughs> Strawberry Yellow, I also get into the head of another character, and usually I, you know, I don't do that. So I try to vary it up, try to challenge me myself more too. What, Susan, what, what, did, what was your question? Um, <clears throat> I have a question because um, I've tried to write some stories and, and one of the things about um, Japanese American characters or storylines that there's so many really complicated uh, circumstances to explain why would anybody be like that and y you know what I mean like and and uh, I know that I've felt like when I've tried to write something, it's like, oh my God, I have to explain this whole history, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, in order to, mm -hmm. but I'm, you know, like I'm, I was interested when you said, I didn't read the book that you said where there was the issue about Japanese and Koreans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And cause that's like an incredibly complicated mm -hmm. story with many nuances and mm -hmm. different opinions mm -hmm. and different reasons for mm -hmm. those opinions. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so th how do you uh, kind of think about that when you're starting to write, or like, how, how do you do that? You know, I think in Masa Rai is like your perfect character to kind of explore these sensitive topics. And one is, he's a person without power. He doesn't really have a, s a direct stakehold 
you know he doesn't own a Japanese company you know he's just a common person and he does have a sense in his own way of right and wrong you know let, let he wants to let's be decent people you know so he he does have a moral compass but it's a very basic one and he's not a calculating person so he but he's seen great you know he experienced the bombing so he, ex he he's gone through like the worst you know experience you know ever created in terms of a, a, a weapon and so he has that empathy I think deep inside he can't help but to have it so like things like um, the comfort woman issue you know these very hot topic things he doesn't really know much about it he's not incredibly sophisticated but he sees like you know, people are in pain and, you know, but he's not going to be overly, um, you know, politicized one way or the other, you know. So I think he, he's like a safe person to travel with. So, like, you feel like, oh, the reader feels like, oh, she, uh, me, the author's trying to, not trying to push me one way or the other. She's just presenting this thing. Again, it's kind of up to the reader. I mean, I'm trying to entertain people too. You know, it's really up to the reader to kind of determine what what happened and who's in the wrong and all these kind of things. But I like it because it's not um, threatening, so people can kind of release their defenses and kind of like enter in. And being a former journalist, I think conversation to me is super important. So. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, it's, in terms of writing nonfiction, it, it's difficult, but I think you should keep working on it. We could talk later yeah. about it, too. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Do you have a sense of who your readers are, their demographics, um, age-wise, and... They, they are, do they do skew older? Um, and I think that just reflects like reading in general. You know, um, there's older, older white women are the most voracious readers, and there's a lot of actually African American women. That there's a lot of book clubs and stuff like that. This has been so interesting to me. You know, I worked in this more Japanese American world, the rough shinpo, so I had a sense of who they were. I thought all of them would follow me to my books. But there's been, met early on when I was doing like different, you know, I had a table and a Nisei woman would be there. Oh, I wrote this novel. Oh, I don't read fiction. <laughs> and then I walk away, I go, oh. <laughs> so, so, but it's been good. And then there's been so many people that look, don't look Japanese at all. They're, you know, blonde and blue eyes or African American and they go, oh, my grandma's Japanese, so yeah. they, or or they, there was someone Japanese American in their life, okay. you know. So um, yeah. my readers, okay. So one segment are like you guys, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've had to woo you guys, believe it or not. Some of you have had to woo because it's a new concept, you know, of detective fiction. And then um, another segment is mystery readers. So I do a lot of, and that's the older population too. So I do a lot of things in the mystery community and they're mostly white. And then another segment is people who love um, hi history. So like a lot of my, and they're, I have, um, for being a female writer, I, ha I have a lot of male readers, more than my colleagues yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> More than my colleagues who write, who have a female character, who are female and write female characters, mm -hmm. they don't have as many male readers, unfortunately. Um, women will read male characters and female. Yeah, I, I, That might be changing in terms of males, but I don't know. But um, because a lot of men could relate to Moss and they like history, you know, I do have some male readers too. Um, and it's expanded um, with my newsletter I give giveaways and now like I don't know most of these people who are buying you know they live all over the place um, one thing that's been interesting is I have gotten some younger readers who love 
Japanese language. So the fact that I use a lot of Japanese, which is a lie, it's criticism, you know, some people criticize that. But actually, that's precisely the reason why certain people like to read it. So you can't make everyone happy, so you just have to write. So I am getting some young readers. I, you know, I, I also intentionally wanted to write younger characters to help, help um, get younger readers, but now I'm, like I ran into this one woman, she says, oh, my 90-year-old father, he's, his, be his own last friend died recently, you know, he's been depressed, but he's been reading your book and he's, he's you know, gotten more en enthusiastic, and I assumed he was reading the Masarai, he goes, no, he's reading the Ellie Rush book, <laughs> because he's imagining himself, like, you know, going through, and I was like, ah, oh, okay, so even with my younger characters, I have an older readership, that's fine, um, because there's so many new writers coming, I, I just feel so encouraged in this day and age that there's so many um, younger Asian Americans, you know, that are really making a name. I, I hope there will be more Japanese Americans. There seems to be more activity in, in other groups, but you know, but I, but so it's like I don't need to worry. Th those young people, they'll be getting their peers. So you know, any other quite? Oh, yes, Aggie. Yes, um, I was born in Washington. Yeah. So I was interested in the history of the. Um, Hirahara house. Yes. The last time we saw it, it looked like it was ready to fall apart. Yes. But I understand that it was a, is it a national? I don't know about, I know there's been work to, in terms of history, I don't really know, Aggie. I don't know the latest. I don't know if, I know there there have been a, some efforts to get some kind of, you know, historic designation. Do you for know it. any history about the house that you could share? Um, I don't know. Um, a whole lot. Um, I do know, you know, as you know, Redmond, I believe Redmond was the architect, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other home, Victorian homes within. Um, I, I know, okay, so what's weird, there needs to be more investigation and actually there is a young woman who, um, she found out about the house and asked me if I was, you know, so I put her in touch with other Hirahara's up here. So she might be doing an article for NBC America, um, a, a kind of looking into some of the history. Um, what's, um, oh, what was the name? There was, he's passed away. There was uh, Sandy, La Sandy Lynn? Oh, yeah. Sandy Lydon. Yeah. Sandy Lydon, yes, Capital College. He had sent one of some, a group of his students to do an archeological study. Did you know about this at the at the house? So they uncovered like uh, bits of Chawan and you know all these kind of things, and then they looked. There's a um, there's a shed in the back, and then uh, in the back of the wall they found this like uh, very radical like <laughs> pamphlet written in Japanese from the 1930s. So I think it's maybe left by somebody who had stayed. The Hirahara house had been a way station for a lot of people be before and after the war. But, you know, I had heard the family story was that uh, they lost the house during World War II. Mm. And then they, well, <laughs> so I heard, I had heard the story, and don't quote me, that <coughs> They had hired a lawyer, they had hired a Jewish lawyer, <laughs> and they were able to get the house back mm -hmm. uh, through that. But I think it's more complicated than that. Than that. And there's a Wikipedia, um, not that you should trust Wikipedia, <laughs> but if you do look up Redman Hirahara House, oh. there's something on that. But I think there's going to be more, more information about the house. You know, it's really ironic because it's hard for me to do research on my own family. You know, it's easier for me to do research on other people's <coughs> families, you know, just because I think it's that whole thing about I hold back, you know, it's this privacy thing, yes. you know, I don't yes. want to, yes. you know, it's so weird, but some of it, so maybe this young woman will be able to get information. <laughs> She's a young me, and she could get the information I could find out. Yeah. Thank you. And then you had a question? Yeah. 
Yeah, you gotta have sex in your book. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. There's a lot of sex. <laughs> you know, our press man goes, Naomi, like when the first book, he goes, do you have any sex or violence? I go, I don't have that much. <laughs> Um, there, yeah, I don't have too much. There is some, well, I, I don't know. I don't want to get into it right now. But, but there's, yeah, it, it's pretty clean on that front. But maybe with the Chicago, I need to, I need to explore that more, right? Push myself. Yeah, that's true. Yes. I am so happy to see you again. This is the third or fourth time that we've, uh, Attended one of your oh, thank events. You so much. And it's great to see the arch of your uh, story, your own life story. So, aloha. Thank you. Um, when are you going to write maybe a story about this area? You've got New York and LA and Hawaii and Chicago. Oh, and you know what? I, I wrote a middle grade book and it has San Jose, Japan town, but it's been rejected <laughs> everywhere. Oh. But it's steampunk, so maybe I'll make it Ooh. history and maybe, yeah. I have, I did do some research. There's uh, some scenes in San Jose, Japan town. So, so we'll see. As a more writing question, you know, authors always say dialogue is so difficult and there's plays and all these other things. What comes easiest for you? Mm -hmm. um, dialogue is not that hard. It's pretty easy and I, I think that's why I like to do I, I like to listen to people, and I think that's probably from my journalist training, you know, because I had to type out what the, you know, just, so I think that's pretty, you know, what's kind of a challenge for me is physical description. I, I'm kind of, you know, not, not as strong as I could be, but, um, yeah, but the other stuff, and character building is pretty easy, those kind of things. I think we're... Oh. We should yeah. move into the next sec You can ask me any questions and um, I'll be selling books too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Give you a little present from our oh. committee. And it's a, a UI bag you. and it's got a UI t shirt in it. Naomi has graciously donated this book. Repurpose. So the last three numbers are 209. Oh. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh. 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 And there are books for sale. Okay, no. Thank you. Get tired. There's regular water. There's mineral water. Ice is water. So you had a few children. My parents are family. You know, the Japanese American National Museum, they're going to receive um, some items from the Hiroshima Peace Museum. From November to March. I'll be there in October. Oh, you're going to be there.